cars and guns. These guys here. Looks like a wrecked truck. Yeah, they decided to pull them over because they looked kind of wild. But they'll start talk, stop, uh, stopping all the traffic there. Pretty quick once they get more people show up. Got seven here. 24 gates over there for people going out of Mexico. At the, in the evening, when these people come back from work, they open all of these here. It still gets backed up an hour. And they have some military presence here to make us feel like everything is going well. Even though it's not. Yeah, all right. Well, it's the mafia are very active at night. They're going to bed right now. All them, uh, all that stuff that's happened, all happens during the uh, nighttime dark. So we're not around here during that time. This road over here is one of six entrances to the 24 gates. And it uh, can be two, three hours long. Where we're going is on this hill where that tall condominium is. It's on that hill over there. If we were stopped, I'd be able to show you. You can't miss it. It's a two-story, large place, white, on the side of the hill there. and the Kahluas. And these jacarandas are popular in San Diego and down here too. Yeah, we've got them out our way. Uh -huh. Do you know if Liz is there this week or the other one? The other one. Mexican flag over there. We're gonna drive it by that to get up to the clinic, the hill here. And I can see the clinic from through the trees there. Everything's in Spanish. States. And here I we've searched out master specialists. We've rebuilt even a lot of my motors here. They're all still running good. I ended up selling some of those cars and those people are still running. <clears throat> Exchange. <clears throat> it, uh, we'll 
see around the corner here. It's 12 something. It was 14. It's come back down a little bit. A little bit. 12.80. You give them a U.S. dollar, they're going to give you 12 Mexican dollars, or pesos they call them, and 80 centavos for your dollar. So that's good for us, and of course bad for the Mexicans. Yes. They have to give 12, 80 to get to go the opposite direction to get one American dollar. You got to give 12 Mexican dollars. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's uh, when it's around there about 10, it's easy to figure out what the cost are. They use both currencies here. Yeah. How do you figure out the price? Well, like this Catholic school up here, they have. <clears throat> Red sweaters for hundred dollars. <throat> well, that's a lot of money for a sweater. It's no, it's a hundred pesos. See, there's the clinic. Is that it? The, the uh -huh. white one. See the clinic on top of the other. So we just moved the decimal over. So yeah, ten dollars. That's more reasonable for a sweater. Now, this Tijuana Juniors is a uh, brother-owned chain. He started with a little van right here 20 years ago. Now he's got a big chain. He's got five of these and his van, which he takes and puts at uh, soccer games. We're going to be in a, in a beautiful, very comfortable building today. The building was, you know, they came down here in 63. door, the Mexican Mafia in the late 70s was building this building. And then uh, as they were moving into it in 1980, the Mafia, they were arrested, jailed, and the city took their building. So it must have been... <coughs> okay, all the policia wants through. There's another one. Me? I think so. Oh, no go across, huh? I think it's pulling you over. Huh? Is it pulling you over? I don't know what's all this all about. <laughs> what's this all about? Oh, I don't know what this all about here. Oh, oh, the camera. Yeah. Oh, okay. You want the camera? Look. Paper is drawing. Oh, line. Draw line. Huh? The draw line, please. The draw line. Paper. Good morning. Everything is okay. Just do the checking, okay? Everything is okay. Okay, you have your driver's license, please? Yes, sí, yes. Sí. Can you, can, can you come out? Sí. Yeah. 15, sir. Where do you work? Um, I'm employed at the moment. Yeah? Yeah, I don't I don't work work work. Work. No, no, no. no. Why, why, why you no, no. Me? Oh, We're going to the hot, uh, biomedical center. I'm making a documentary about, about um, cancer. And, and why are you playing here when we are we we cross out in front of you? I just I've had it on you can I can show you I had it on the whole way All since right. we crossed the border.
police. You're not to take any pictures of any of the police in town here. Yeah. You know, at the border, or even American police, right? No, no, no pictures. So they can see that. Anyway. But what do they do with? I mean, tourists. That's what tourists do: is carry video cameras around. Yeah, I don't. I can't take pictures of anybody in the police. But uh, this was a school here, a high school. And we're up in actually a wealthy uh, residential area here. You can see, uh, very few areas look as nice as this here. Up on top of the hill, we've got some could be millionaires living because uh, somebody bought the top of this hill subdivided it into 200 lots and took all the utilities and put them underground so you had unobstructed views. And then you have uh, the clubhouse they put up there with the swimming pool and tennis courts. And then they had uh, maybe half of those 200 lots built on with two and three story mansions with three, four, five car garages. So there's some wealthy people on top of the hill here. It doesn't snow here, so we can always get to the clinic. <laughs> doesn't even freeze here. Here's the original clinic here. I parked the car down here. They still own that area there. And this, this is their dentist here. The clinic and the walled area all the way to the clinic uh, corner, I mean, is the biomedical center. Security to look at. Yeah, just make everybody feel more secure. Good morning. A little restaurant here next to the x ray department. And they got a lot of. Uh, over a hundred parakeets. We'll open this up for them here. It warms up a bit. Morning. He just wants a picture as if it was just, you know, like, just, you're walking through and you see your doctor sitting together. Yeah, that's what it is. Por algunos de los primeros que estaba tomando, 
Entonces, este, les quería preguntar si han visto alguna situación parecida a algo relacionado con... La U, puede ser, la U. ¿Ah, sí? La U puede ser, okay. que me dio a tener esta Yo sé que no tengo experiencia aquí. Pues si... Es el U, es el U, es el U, es el U, es el U. ¿Por qué se nos quiere preguntar si ustedes han visto si alguno de los pasajes que llegan con alguno de los supervisores? Ah, ya lo habíamos visto. Ok, esta canción ya la hemos visto. Gracias. Muchas gracias, doctores. They are one in the picture. Um, let's start off. Uh, can you tell me your name? My name is Kim Pierce. And um, what is your position here? I'm assistant director at the Biomedical Center. Okay. Uh, say, say that again in one, in one sentence. I am the assistant director of the Biomedical Center. Okay. Um, tell me, you were telling me... Let's sit down here. So you were telling me about your experience with cancer. Um, can you share that story with me? I will. And in 1999, I went into the doctor for a routine mammogram, and I was uh, I had a suspicious lump that I felt was suspicious. Told them about it, and they examined it. And next thing I know, I was put into an ultrasound room, and an ultrasound was given to me. I was asking them why they were giving me an ultrasound mm. and they said they couldn't tell me anything even though it was a doctor who was performing the ultrasound until my own doctor would give me the results. So I asked them, um, you know, when I would have those results, they didn't know any of the answers. So I called my own doctor after it was over and was told that they didn't know anything about this whole ultrasound or anything. <laughs> so. Um, I, they finally called me back a few hours later and let me know that it was going to be necessary for me to see a surgeon immediately. So I called the surgeon and I made an appointment and I had an appointment for the following day. Went in, I was sitting in there waiting, waiting in the way, in the uh, in the doctor's office or the examination room, excuse me, and the. Um, doctor came in and immediately said we need to do a biopsy right away and then we'll schedule your surgery right away and I was so confused I went I, do I have cancer no one had even told me I had cancer at that point and so I said to her um, she said well, well where are you ready to schedule this appointment and I said no the only thing that I'm going to do right now is I'm going to put my clothes back on and I'm going to walk out of this room and get my films and I forgot the part about <laughs> where where I had uh, she had told me I need all of this and it, it wasn't even a five-minute appointment yeah. and I said uh, do you have any idea what my name is yeah. and she she stammers and she looked down finally looked down at my chart and she goes Kim and I said thank you and that's at that point when I said I'll be re getting redressed and and leaving and I would like to have my films that I had paid for and everyone was just completely I have no idea what you're talking about you know no one's ever done this before you know they've so, never seen anyone so. stand up to the, the doctor and I, take control of their own I'm thinking that that was the case yeah. yes <laughs> so what did you do so you took the films and what did you they, do? they didn't give them to me immediately I had to go back a couple of days later to get them but they handed them to me like I had the plague or something like oh there you go you know see you later and uh, I never went back so uh, my next step was that I immediately made airplane reservations and and I made my way down to this clinic so when that was within and how did you hear three to four days how did you hear about the biomedical center my sister about five years earlier had been treated here for systemic lupus she was the first patient who was treated for systemic lupus here and she and and Mildred Nelson developed the treatment for it and my sister was very 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 sick and it told me that if I ever was told I had cancer that this is where I was gonna go and she was right, that's where I went so, I came down here. So what happened after you brought your, your films down here? Um, they s it began treating me for uh, with the Hoxie tonic and, and the diet, and I was 
strictly adhered to it for one year, it was very, very early stages that I had. So it only took one year for me to be completely free. It was dissolved. It was gone, you know, so it was one year later. And, uh, and since that time, I've never had, to re had a recurrence. And uh, how, how long after that did you come to work here? I came to work here two and a half years ago, in, which was in uh, February of 2007. Okay. Um, so how many years after that? Uh, that was 99, so that would be eight years. Okay, uh -huh. let's, eight let's years. say that in a whole sentence. Um, when, um, how long after that did you come work here? Uh, eight years later. Okay. Um, you, you, you told me a story about um, Mildred being a smoker. Can we... Well, there are a lot of funny stories that patients will tell me who have met Mildred. Um, I did not ever have the opportunity to meet Mildred, unfortunately, but many <laughs> patients who knew her for, the, for many, many years have told me that Mildred was, was a heavy smoker. And Mildred would walk up and down the halls with a cigarette, and people would say, Mildred, how in the world can you be a smoker and run a cancer clinic? And her response to that would be, because I have the cure. <laughs> the and, end. <laughs> yeah. and, and tell me, uh, so she died of? She died of, of uh, uh, cardiac arrest. And at how old? You know, how old? Um, Oh my gosh, she, uh, Mildred, I believe she was 79. Okay. Yes. And tell me about her lungs when she died. Her lungs were completely clear, completely, because Mildred would, um, would take her own medicine. She would take, she would put herself on tonic approximately once a year. Just as a preventative? Stories, I understand, as a preventative, yes. Because she knew she was smoking cigarettes and... That. Yeah, wanted to prevent cancer, and so she she took it. Um, I don't know specifically how long she would be on it. I don't know specifically what the, uh, you know, if it was once yeah. a year, or twice a year, or whatever. But I understand that she did it. But she was her lungs were completely clear. <laughs> and yeah. she was a smoker all her life. A smoker all of her life that I'm aware of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now, did you or did you not want to talk about how Harry died? You don't. Wanna... I don't. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'll. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll I just don't have the, you know, yeah. I don't have no, I know. The, anything to back it up. Yeah, I know. You know, we'll so. We're to find something. Yeah. And that story about Mildred, you know, that's st strictly a story as well. But I've had many patients tell me yeah. that same story, you know. I can so that. I want to make sure, you know, that it's not coming from me, but it is, it's funny, you know. I mean, it is funny because yeah. people would be like, she's quite a gal, you yeah. know, quite a lady. That, that she that, sounds like she yeah, was. Yeah, she was. Totally, completely believed in this, and and her patients. That's all that mattered in her life were her patients, you know. So it was a. Tell me a little about. I mean, just talk about the Hoxie a little. I mean, what if 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 you had one minute to tell the world about what happens here? How would you? Uh, about. Like how patients feel when they walk through the door, type of thing, or or just how our I treatment, mean, uh, how we go about the just the fact. I mean, this is our, our, this, set, is, our this setting. This is the legendary cure for cancer. It's the literal holy grail of the medical society, and it's here in this little building in Tijuana, and that's and people have to fight to come down here to 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 get this. Can you? I don't talk about some, um, talk about the how effective it is or just how frustrating it is that it's not it's not better accepted. Let's wait till that plane's gone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll have to think about it a little bit anyway. About um, uh, I suppose you know. Tell me if this is what you're what you're alluding to, but. Um, by the time a person comes to here, here frequently, they're in pretty late stages of cancer. And they're, I would say, because of what it takes to get here, meaning they have to make sure that they have a, you know, at this moment, a driver's license or some sort of identification for them to return to the United States. It's quite an undertaking, yeah. you know, that they have to find out uh, you know where to stay, how to get here, those types of things, which is really quite simple once they've called here and spoken to us about yeah. it. 
But they um, also have to fight their own doctors who are almost certainly telling them not to bother. Oftentimes, um, they're, they're, um, someone's coming out. Oftentimes they're, uh, they're told by their own doctors that, well, if you're going to seek this treatment, don't bother coming back to me again. So essentially they're being fired by their doctors and they want to, um, you know, they, this is their, their, they feel their last hope, you know, so they come down here looking for this. Oftentimes they don't have their records with them because I don't know if they weren't if there was stalling or, yeah. or what the problem was on, yeah. on behalf of their own doctors not wanting to give those records to them but it, it's okay because once they get here you know we have the have the resources to getting to you know getting their um, uh, examinations as well we do examinations but I mean getting a, a ultrasound MRI CT scans if necessary uh, the, the thing you do is, MRIs is that, and CT scans here. Uh, we don't do the MRIs or CT scans here at this clinic, but we have another clinic where we drive. We personally drive people to that clinic. Oh. It's about a mile away from here, and that's what they specialize in is imaging. Okay. And they, um, the the thing is, is that it would be a lot less expensive for them to be able to bring their own. And that and that's what we're driving at. We yeah. we don't want to make money off of you know other uh, uh, images or anything like that so if they have some that were taken within the last couple of months then we'd prefer that they'd bring them because we can read them here we have all the equipment to yeah. read them we have a radiologist on staff so you know to keep the cost down because probably by the time they've gotten here they've spent everything they had yeah. possibly lost everything they had and you know, so we want to keep the cost down for them, and that's what we've strived to do. Keep <laughs> the least stress possible yeah. is the best. Yeah. And so, once they arrive here, it's a very casual setting, very laid back. I think one of the what what I've been told, oftentimes by people, is that this is the house of hope. I've had patients say that many, many times, and that. What more could you ask for? Yeah. And the hope is probably 90% of the treatment is their own, how they feel about it, how it's going to be effective for them. Um, um, anything else you want to add? Well, one other thing is... It, once a person has been declared free of cancer, more times than not, our patients continue coming down here for an annual checkup. Mm -hmm. And we do do general physicals for people, so you don't have to have cancer to come here. Mm -hmm. You can just come down just for a general physical. Just because the doctors are so great, I mean, it's... Yes, and you get all your test results in one day. We have all the lab equipment here. You get everything. It's fully explained to you, so those are your blood tests, your analysis, um, vitals, if wanted, x-rays, they, you know, that's not required, it's not necessary, but if they would like to have them, you know, we'll do that as part of it too. And it's reasonably inexpensive, um, and very thorough. And most times that people have those tell me that this is the most thorough examination they've ever had. So we get it a lot. We get a lot of people who come here just for that. And like I said, and the cancer-free cancer, cancer -free patients just want to come back for a checkup annually. Yeah. So. Well, hold on, because... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Airport, right there. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the second day in a row the sun never came out. This is called May Gray. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's nice. That's nice. And June Gloom is coming on nice. Monday. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's quieted down. Um, uh, anything else? I, I just, no, I just think it's interesting. We've had generations of people coming here, two people who were, who knew about the clinic from when they were children or had heard about it through generations of their own families who have relatives who have who've been to the clinic when it was in the United States. Mm -hmm. And then maybe have put it on the back burner of their mind and then something happens with them or a family member and 
um, all of a sudden they'll remember, oh, I remember, you know, a place that my parents used to go or my uncle went or whatever. And um, so they'll come here for treatment as well. Uh, most of the time our patients have already been through other traditional methods of treatment. So, um, you know, so this is not their the very first treatment that they've sought. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, well, almost, let, me, let me change discs here because this one's just about out. 